Hallelujah. It's good to be in the house of the Lord, Tree of Life Church. Are you happy to be in the house of the Lord tonight? Hallelujah. How many can testify with me tonight that he is good? Hallelujah. You are good, Lord. We love you and we worship you. He's so good to us. We've made it this far through the week. He's provided everything we need.
the name of the Lord. Why don't you find somebody near you right now? Just reach over. Just put your hand on their shoulder and pray for them right now in the name of Jesus. Let's pray together. Come on, let's pray together in Jesus' name. Lord, I thank you for my brother and my sister. I thank you, Lord, for your healing power. Lord, let the ministry of your spirit be alive and well in this house. God, I thank you that you are great and greatly to be praised. Lord, move in this house. Move in this house. Lord, in Jesus' name, touch somebody right now, oh God. Touch somebody right now, oh God. Lord, in Jesus' name, let the mighty power of your truth begin to work a work in this house. In Jesus' name, we trust in you. We lean on you. Hallelujah. 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 Uh, we call upon the mighty name of Jesus. We call upon the mighty name of Jesus. Hallelujah. 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 Oh, we bless your name, oh God. We bless your name, oh God. We bless your name, oh God. Let's clap our hands unto the Lord. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Jesus. Amen. Amen. You may be seated in the name of the Lord. I want to take a little time tonight to just talk to you about some things that are obviously upon us. Uh, our world is in need of Jesus. Uh, amen. They're in need of Jesus. We, we knew these days were coming and they are here. They are here. And, uh, and, and we want to know what's going on. I want to turn your attention to the book of Romans chapter 13. Uh, the book of Romans chapter 13, and we're going to read a verse of Scripture tonight, Romans chapter 13 and verse 11. The Scripture says this in verse, uh, we're, going to read, we're going to read verses 11 through 14. The Word of the Lord says this, that knowing the time that now it is high time to awake out of sleep, for now is our salvation nearer than when we believed. The night is far spent, the day is at hand. Let us therefore cast off the works of darkness. Let us put on the armor of light. Let us walk honestly as in the day, not in rioting, not in drunkenness, not in chambering, not in wantonness, not in strife, not in envying, but put ye on the Lord Jesus Christ and make not provision for the flesh. Praise God to fulfill the lusts thereof. And I want to speak to you this evening on the subject knowing the time, that knowing the time, that now it is high time to awake out of sleep. Uh, I remember various times in my uh, life growing up when there were moments in, uh, in time where we were very startled by the happenings of our day, when there were clearly signs of the end time upon us. In fact, the night that I received the Holy Ghost, I was six years old. Uh, it was in 1986, and the preacher that night uh, preached a message about what is going to happen to the kids after the rapture. And I, uh, I don't think I ever heard what he said was going to happen to the kids after the rapture. I just knew it wasn't going to happen to me. <laughs> Praise God. Amen. And I got the Holy Ghost that night. Amen. My mother even told me earlier that day, she said, I believe you're going to get the Holy Ghost tonight. And uh, she was right. I got the Holy Ghost, and uh, I was sitting on her lap. My Grandmother was praying with me. It was at Calvary Tabernacle in Indianapolis, Indiana. And uh, I've been laboring for the Lord ever since. <laughs> Praise God. Amen. <laughs> Amen. That's been 37 years ago. And we're thankful to the Lord for that. So the, 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 the surrounding of end time events, they've been around us for a long time. And you, if you've lived for the Lord very long, or if you've been around the church very much or through the years, you probably have heard uh, statements 
uh, saying that very thing, that, uh, that these are the last days, these are the end times, that we are, they are upon us. And if you've heard that enough, sometimes you would be tempted to draw conclusions that it's just going to go back to the way it was, whatever that may have been. But I want you to understand something, ladies and gentlemen, that the Lord is soon to return. He is soon to return. And you have got to be ready to meet the Lord because He's going to catch away His church, and He is coming for a spotless bride. He is coming for a spotless bride, without spot, without wrinkle, one that is washed in the blood of the Lamb. That's what the Lord is coming to, to return for. And we want to be in that number. Uh, the, the old song says, Oh, when the saints go marching in. Lord, I want to be in that number, oh, when the saints go marching in. And so it's very important that you are ready to meet the Lord when He returns. It's very important that you're ready to meet the Lord when He returns. Some people have talked about being traumatized by, uh, by the idea that they have been told the Lord was coming, uh, the fear that it put in them. They've, t they've described that they lived in anxiety. Listen, I, I, I know all about that. I, I mean, if I came home and nobody else was there, there was only one explanation. There were no other alternative explanations. It, Jesus had come back and I had been left behind. That was the only explanation. And I'm, you talk about a prayer meeting that went on. Amen. And, uh, and if, if you've been around, if you grew up in this, then you know that you had those moments where you, it just, it felt like, it felt like the Lord had come back. And, uh, and uh, my brother calls a, a gray day drizzly, uh, one that doesn't have much sunshine, he calls it a good rapture weather day. Man, those are, those are the days you know he could come back, especially if what is going on now we're going on then. Uh, those are good rapture weather days. And, 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 and some people have bemoaned that. They've said, you know, we were living in fear. I want to tell you what, I am so thankful that I grew up with a mindset that Jesus could come back at any moment. And I am so thankful. I, it, it, I, it didn't make me feel traumatized. It made me feel like I needed to be ready. And I'm thankful there were those moments where I wondered, did it happen? Did it happen and I missed it? Because that made me realize, hey, it could happen, and if I'm not ready, I'd miss it. You want to be ready to meet the Lord. The Bible tells us to be ready. The Bible tells us to be ready. This isn't made up by preachers to, to get you to do what preachers want you to do. No, the Bible tells us to be watchmen on the wall, to look out over the horizon and to describe that the enemy is coming and to make people aware that the enemy is on the horizon. And so it's very vitally important that you be aware of the time, that you know the time, and that you are aware of the happenings that are going on. So this past week, at no news to most here, a week ago Saturday, Hamas, the terrorist organization uh, connected to, uh, to uh, the Gaza Strip that came in to Israel and perpetrated a terribly uh, terrorist act upon the people of Israel, and uh, Israel responded, and they responded with a, a righteous anger that is, that is uh, it's, like, it's like we're reading an Old Testament passage. It, when we look at the battle between uh, Hamas and the Israeli Defense Forces, it, it's like reading an Old Testament passage. They are not going to tolerate it anymore. It, it is getting ready to be put down. And, uh, and, and their, their response to this, nobody's going to stop them from responding. I want you to understand that. Nobody, the U.S. isn't going to stop them from responding. And world pressure is not going to stop them from responding. And protests in the Middle East, is not, they're not going to stop them from responding. Israel is going to respond, and they are responding, and they're preparing ground forces. The seriousness of what is happening right now, right now, I'm not trying to make you afraid. 
I'm trying to wake you up and make you realize the time has come. And, and this is a mercy moment that God has given you to let you understand that, that what, what we know is going to happen could very well happen right now. When Israel goes in, uh, across the Middle East, there are eruptions of, of, uh, eruptions of protest at U.S. embassies, and they are, they are voicing their anger. They're vowing to jump in at a certain moment, Hezbollah vowing. Iran is talking about what they uh, are planning to do, and, and you never know which countries could, could come in. In 1948, there were seven Arab nations that flooded Israel when Israel became a state. And in 1967, uh, the Six-Day War, and 1973, the Yom Kippur War, on and on, there have been wars, there have been, there have been uh, skirmishes, but what we're seeing right now, we're seeing something that is developing that has not, has not developed uh, in recent years. And Israel going in as they are in response to this Hamas treachery is setting the stage for what the Bible says will happen. And if you're playing games with God, the games have to stop. If you're playing games with your walk with God, you've got to stop that. If you're holding unforgiveness in your heart, you've got to get rid of that. If there's some sinful behavior or sinful nature that you're holding on to, you've got to put that down and under the blood of Jesus Christ. It's time to get right with God. That knowing the time, it is high time to wake out of sleep. Here's what the Bible tells us will happen. The Bible tells us that Jerusalem is going to be surrounded, that that holy city is going to be surrounded. So when I read news stories of, of, uh, of people in Greece who are from the Middle East who are protesting in Greece saying, we're going to march to Jerusalem, I'm reading what the Bible says will happen. And the Bible teaches us that they're going to come from all over and they're going to surround the holy city, they're going to encompass the holy city, and that God is going to rise up in defense of the people of Israel. That's what the Bible tells us. Ezekiel chapter 38, I'm going to read to you uh, some of the uh, scriptures that, that, that help us to understand what is happening in the Middle East right now. Ezekiel 38, verse 1, the word of the Lord came unto me, saying, Son of man, set thy face against Gog, the land of Magog, the chief prince of Meshech and Tubal, and prophesy against him, and say, Thus saith the Lord God, Behold, I am against thee, O Gog, the chief prince of Meshech and Tubal. Now, these, these princes of Gog and Magog and Meshech and Tubal, these are geographical references to nations and superpowers or powers that are in the northern regions, and they are kings of the north, and and the Lord is prophesying against them. Verse four, He said, "I will turn thee back; I will put hooks into thy jaws; I will bring thee forth, and all thine army." Horses and horsemen, all of them clothed with all sorts of armor, a great company with bucklers and shields, all of them handling swords. The Lord is saying that my judgment is coming upon Gog and Magog and Meshach and Tubal. These are, these are references. Really, it's dealing with Russia and China, Moscow. So you're going to see those players get involved, and it won't be too far into the distant uh, in, into the future. The, you're gonna, they have been somewhat silent, except Russia, just this week, just in the last couple of days, Russia made a statement. They've changed their policy, and they made anti-Israel statements just this week. And that's up to this point, they've been supportive of Israel. But just this week, Vladimir Putin has, has turned the table there and said that, that he is in opposition to, to what Israel is doing. And, and to me, that was the first indicator that, that the hook is being set in Magog's mouth. 
and he's being drawn into the valley. Now, when I say he's being drawn into the valley, what am I saying? I'm saying that the kings of this earth and the kingdoms of this earth that have perpetrated such evil upon people and have, have perpetrated such evil against the things of God, God is getting ready to judge those kingdoms. That's what's, and, and the way that he's going to judge them is that he's going to, he's going to draw them to the place where they are going to have a battle. They think it's going to be a battle with Israel. It's actually going to be a battle with him. And so verse 5 says, Persia, Ethiopia, Libya with them, all of them with shield and helmet. These are regions. These are ancient regions that cover the land territories that we're looking at today. Gomer and all his bands, the house of Togarma of the north quarters and all his bands and many people with thee, be thou prepared and prepare for thyself, thou and all thy company that are assembled unto thee, and be thou a guard unto them. After many days thou shalt be visited. In the latter years thou shalt come into the land that is brought back from the sword, and is gathered out of many people against the mountains of Israel, which have always been waste, but it is brought forth out of the nations, and they shall dwell safely, all of them. So this is a reference this is a reference to the fact that there is, there is a restor restoration of Israel to that land and they're dwelling safely. Thou shalt ascend and come like a storm. Thou shalt be like a cloud to cover the land. Thou and all thy bands and many people with thee. This is the ancient prophecy of Ezekiel to modern times. And he is telling these nations that they're going to come up like a storm. They're going to be drawn. The hook is going to be put in their jaw. They're going to be drawn into a battle with God. Thus saith the Lord, it shall come to pass that at the same time shall things come into thy mind. And thou shalt think an evil thought. And thou shalt say, I will go up to the land of unwalled villages unwalled villages. This is a reference to free nations, unwalled villages. It's, it's not even something that made sense in the days that it was written. There were no such thing as cities without walls in those days. That was one of the, that was one of the uh, trademarks of a city was that it had walls. But in modern times, we have something called freedom. America is a free nation. Israel is a free nation, and, and there are, freedom is something that has spread through our world, but there's an evil thought that is creeping into the mind of these principalities that are, are present, and it is this, that I will go up to the land of unwalled villages, I will go to them that are at rest, I will go to them that dwell safely, all of them dwelling without walls and having neither bars nor gates. He is referring to a place that is safe and sound, a place that is free, and, and they're coming. I will go to take a spoil. I will go to take a prey, to turn thine hand upon the desolate places that are now inhabited and upon the people that are gathered out of the nations. This really does have a, a lot of, uh, a lot of uh, similarity to America as well the place that are gathered out of the nations, and, of course, to Israel. Uh, Israel being a place that, that the, the people have been gathered out of the nations. They had been a part of the diaspora, and now they have been gathered to the holy city, to the holy nation. And so this, they're coming to the place where there are people gathered out of the nations, which have gotten cattle and goods that dwell in the midst of the land. Sheba, again, we're talking, about, we're talking about a region here. It's the Middle East region. Sheba and Dedan and the merchants of Tarshish with all the young lions. Now, the young lions, these are, these are prophetic references. The lion, of course, uh, prophetically speaking, uh, we understand that Great Britain is, is, a, is a, uh, characterized by the symbol of the lion. And... And the, the nations that came out of Great Britain, which would include America and Canada and Australia and the nations that are aligned with the concept of freedom, 
The Bible says, art thou, they will say unto thee, are you come to take a spoil? The Bible is describing the alliances that will exist in the future. All the way back to Ezekiel chapter 38. The alliances that will exist in the future. And we're watching those alliances form right now. They're forming right now. So the young lions thereof shall say unto thee, art thou come to take a spoil? Hast thou gathered thy company to take a prey, to carry away silver and gold, to take away cattle and goods, to take a great spoil? Therefore, Ezekiel, son of man, Ezekiel, prophesy and say unto Gog, thus saith the Lord God, in that day... When my people of Israel dwelleth safely, shalt thou not know it? And thou shalt come from thy place out of the north parts. That's how we know these are northern regions. This is why you're going to see, that's why you're already seeing Lebanon get involved. The, 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 the U.S. Embassy right now is surrounded in Beirut. We need, we need to pray for the peace of this situation. Even though it's foretold in the scriptures what's going to happen, we are commissioned to pray for the peace of God. Amen. And so the scripture says that thou shalt come from thy place out of the north parts, thou and many people with thee, all of them riding upon horses, a great company, a mighty army. Thou shalt come up against my people of Israel as a cloud to cover the land. Israel does, is not concerned about that cloud. They expect it. They, they know exactly what's, what, what could happen, and they expect, they expect there to be a, a, a gathering of those enemies, and they're not afraid of it. They have, a, they have a slogan, and the slogan is never again. And never again means that we will never be in a position where we experience anything like the Holocaust ever again. We will defend ourselves. And you've got to understand, the nations surrounding Israel do not want Israel to exist. They do not want, they're on record as vowing the annihilation of Israel. So Israel is going to defend itself regardless. And the scripture tells us what's, what's going to happen. You shall come from your place. You shall come from the north parts. Verse 16, you shall come up against my people of Israel as a cloud to cover the land. It shall be in the latter days, and I will bring thee against my land. I will bring thee against my land, that the heathen may know me when I shall be sanctified in thee, O Gog, before their eyes. Gog doesn't believe in God, and he's about to meet him. Thus saith the Lord God, art thou he of whom I have spoken in old time by my servants, the prophets of Israel, which prophesied in those days many years that I would bring thee against them? And it shall come to pass at the same time when Gog shall come against the land of Israel, saith the Lord God, that my fury shall come up in my face. For in my jealousy and in the fire of my wrath have I spoken. Surely in that day there shall be a great shaking in the land of Israel. What we're about to see, and it may be at this moment, I, we don't want to put dates on it. We do have precedent where it came right up to the precipice and then it, it simmered for a while. Now that may happen again. We don't know. We don't know the day. We don't know the hour. But we know that it, it shall come to pass. But what we're going to see and what could happen right now in the, in the next however long, we're going to see the nations of the earth, the armies of the earth come against Israel and come against the young lions and even Sheba and uh, Dedan, which is a, uh, which is really a reference to Saudi Arabia. This is why there's that unique alliance with Saudi Arabia and Israel and America. The, the Bible is foretelling those alliances way back in the days of Ezekiel. And those are the same alliances that exist right now. The Lord said they would exist, and here they do exist. And the nations of the earth, Gog and Magog, I've been, I've been trying to say for years, Watch China, Russia, and Iran because they are an alliance. The Bible says that they are an alliance. They are, they are going to be connected, and they are going to come against Israel. And when they come against Israel, the Lord said, 
the fire of my fury is going to come up in my face. And I'm going to tell you that the modern world has never seen the fury of God. The modern world has never seen His jealousy. The modern world has never seen His wrath. But when he sees Israel surrounded by the armies of the earth and they come in and like a cloud, like a storm, the fury of God is going to rise up in his face. And I'm going to tell you, ladies and gentlemen, this is, this is what is about to happen. And, and, and I'm going to tell you that before that happens, the Spirit of the Lord is going to catch his church away. And the Lord God is going to return for his people. And you'd better be in that number. I'm telling you, the Lord could come back at any moment. The Lord could come back at any moment. Amen. And, and when that last trumpet sounds, you want to be ready for the Lord's return. So what is happening right now has been happening for many years. Genesis chapter 16, I want to read to you a few verses of Scripture. Genesis uh, chapter 16, the word of the Lord says this in verse 7, the angel of the Lord found her, Hagar, by a fountain of water in the wilderness, by the fountain in the way to Shur. He said, Hagar, Sarah's maid, whence camest thou? Whither wilt thou go? She said, I flee from the face of my mistress, Sarah. And the angel of the Lord said unto her, return to thy mistress, submit thyself unto her hands. The angel of the Lord said unto her, I will multiply thy seed exceedingly, that it shall not be numbered for multitude. This is, a, this is a communication between the Lord's messenger, the angel of the Lord, and Hagar. Hagar was the handmaid of Sarah, and when Sarah could not bring forth a child, they, she said to Abraham that he should have a child with Hagar. The child that Abraham had with Hagar was Ishmael. And Ishmael became the father of the Arab nations. And the promise of God for Abraham was never going to come through Ishmael. It was always going to come through Isaac. There is an important statement in the scripture, and it says this, In Isaac shall thy seed be called. In Isaac shall thy seed be called. That is the Lord telling Abraham that the lineage that will bring forth Messiah is going to come through the lineage of Isaac. It's not going to come through the lineage of Ishmael. Now that doesn't mean that Ishmael can't be saved, and that doesn't mean that, that God doesn't have, that God doesn't love Ishmael. In fact, you see in this passage, his compassion for Hagar, his outreach to Ishmael, and the Lord does love Ishmael, and he says, I will multiply his seed for multitude. And in verse number 10, verse 11, the angel of the Lord said unto her, Behold, thou art with child, you shall bear a son, you shall call his name Ishmael, because the Lord hath heard thy affliction. But he warned her, he said, he's going to be a wild man. His hand will be against every man, and every man's hand will be against him, and he shall, be, he shall dwell in the presence of all his brethren. And this is, a, this is a prophetic reference to what Ishmael's challenges were going to be from that point forward, and that's what they were. These were going to be his challenges, and there was a jealousy that Ishmael had toward Isaac from the very beginning. Genesis chapter 21, verse 1, the Lord visited Sarah as he had said, and the Lord did unto Sarah as he had spoken. For Sarah conceived and bare Abraham a son in his old age, at the set time of which God had spoken to him. And Abraham called the name of his son that was born unto him, whom Sarah bare to him, Isaac, or Esau. And Abraham circumcised his son Isaac, being eight days old, as God had commanded him, and Abraham was a hundred years old when his son Isaac was born unto him. Sarah said, God hath made me to laugh, so that all that hear will laugh with me. She named her son Laughter. I think that's such a remarkable name for Isaac to be called, because he's the promised son. He had been long awaited, and they named him Laughter. 
That's important because it gives you a sense of what God wants for his people, even in the midst of such great adversity, even in the midst of great sorrow and trouble. I mean, Abraham was the father of many nations. And Israel, Jacob, who became Israel, Israel was the prince who has prevailed with God and man and one who rules as God. But Isaac was laughter. And it's the simplicity between the nobility of Abraham and Israel. There's a simplicity to be found in all of it. I saw that when I was in Tel Aviv. It, it was really striking to me when I was landing in Tel Aviv. And I saw that little strip of land that God promised to Abraham, a little place called Israel. And it was just this little small piece of land. And on the outside of it, I mean everywhere you looked, it had the sea to border it on one side. But to the north, to the east, and to the south, that little strip of land was surrounded by nations of people who were descendants of Ishmael, who are on record as vowing that the people who live in that little strip of land will not live. They will die. That's the promise of the nations that have their eyes set upon Israel. And I'm about to land in Tel Aviv, and I'm thinking to myself as we're about to land, I'm thinking, how do these people live comfortably in this little strip of land, knowing that surrounding them are people who are determined that they will not live. And it is a, a shocking thing. Can you imagine if those of us in the tri-state area were surrounded by governments, nations, armies of people who are funded by some of the most powerful first forces on the earth, and they were determined that we would be annihilated and wiped off the face of the earth? And my father was, we were talking about it just last night, and he made an, a, a good point. He said, he said, there is no other group of people that are of eight to nine million in population that have the attention of the whole world upon them. You know why? Because of the spiritual significance connected to what is happening. And this that is taking place is an age-old, an age-old grievance. And it takes place in Genesis chapter 21. Sarah said, God made me to laugh. They that hear me will laugh with me. She said, who would have said unto Abraham, this Sarah should have given children suck, for I have borne him a son in his old age. And the child grew and was weaned, and Abraham made a great feast the same day that Isaac was weaned. Now notice verse 9. Sarah saw the son of Hagar, the Egyptian, which she had borne unto Abraham. She saw, her, saw that son of Hagar mocking. Ishmael was mocking Isaac. As children, Ishmael was mocking Isaac. And Mama Bear, Sarah, saw Ishmael mocking Isaac, and she said, that's not going to happen. She told Abraham, I want Ishmael gone, and I want Hagar gone. So we saw in Genesis, Genesis 16 that Hagar was, was, had left, she was put out, and then she came back and submitted herself to Sarah. But now in Genesis chapter 21, her son Ishmael has grown up a little bit. Isaac has been weaned, and Isaac is being celebrated, and Ishmael, out of envy, is mocking Isaac. And I want you to know that what is happening to this day is still born of envy. An envy that Ishmael has toward Isaac. And I'm going to tell you, when the favor of God rests upon a person, many times there will be envy involved of others that look upon them. It is inexplicable. It's unexplainable. It, it, it doesn't make any sense. The person didn't do anything to bring that envy upon themselves, but the envy is born out of, it's really, it was really manifest in Lucifer from the very beginning. He wanted to be exalted above the Lord, exalted, exalted beyond measure. And he was cast out of heaven the way that Hagar was cast out of the 
out of the place in Genesis chapter 21. You can't have envy in your spirit. You cannot have envy. James chapter 4 said that wars have come from envy. Every war that you can even fathom has its root system in the simplicity of envy. It all starts with one group of people wanting what another group of people have. You cannot covet. You cannot envy. It will absolutely destroy your soul. Ishmael began to mock Isaac. Isaac was being celebrated. Ishmael began to mock him. And Ishmael and Hagar, was, they were cast out. Now, this brings me to an important point, and it's important for us to recognize. When we talk about Hagar and Ishmael being cast out, the Bible tells us we know that was a, a real-life event for that family, Hagar and Ishmael. But the Apostle Paul tells us that it was more than just a real-life event, that it was an allegory. It was an allegory to teach us how our life is supposed to live. So what we're witnessing right now in the natural over in Jerusalem, Israel, is even now an allegory of what is happening in the spiritual. Jerusalem is a type of the church, and Israel is a type of Christ. And what gives Jerusalem natural its protection is the fact that Israel is a state. The reason that 1948 was the year that Israel became a state was they came out of that Holocaust and said, never again. We are laying claim to the promises of God. We're going to step into the land he promised our father Abraham. We're not being scattered anymore. We're not going to be stuck in other nations that could turn on us and, and put upon us a terrible execution as was done in Nazi Germany. We're going to step into the promises of God. And they marched right back into that land of Canaan and said, this belongs to our fathers and God promised it to us and we're going to live here now. And they did. And and Ishmael came in like a flood and tried to, tried to destroy Isaac. And there have been fightings from that day until now, and we're seeing a modern-day version of it. But while it's a real-life event, it is also an allegory, and it is teaching us. Let me, let me turn your attention to the book of Galatians chapter 4, because the Apostle Paul deals with this matter of Hagar and Ishmael being cast out from and by Sarah. Galatians chapter uh, 4, I want to read to you. Uh, we'll start at verse number 22. For it is written that Abraham had two sons, the one by a bondmaid, that's Hagar, the other by a free woman, that's Sarah. But he who was of the bondwoman, he who was of the bondwoman, that's Ishmael, was born after the flesh. This was not what God had ordered or ordained. He was born after the flesh. He was born after the concoctions of Abraham and Sarah. But he of the free woman, Isaac of Sarah, was born by promise. This was Isaac being the promised seed. Verse 24, which things are an allegory, for these are the two covenants the one from the Mount Sinai, which gendereth to bondage, which is Agar or Hagar. The one from Mount Sinai. Now, you've heard me teach before that God's perfect will was that man receive the law of the Lord emblazoned upon his heart. But because of man's stubbornness and hardness of heart, he resisted the will of God, and he ended up having to receive that law from Moses, and it became the law of Moses instead of the law of the Lord. It was the law of the Lord, but it was via Moses, and it convoluted what could have been something that was written in their hearts. So Paul is saying what happened on that Mount Sinai, God giving the law to Moses and Moses having to give it to the people because the people wouldn't receive it directly by promise, is exactly what happened with Hagar and Sarah. Abraham came up with a plan different than God's plan, and it produced Ishmael. He said, this Hagar, verse 25, is Mount Sinai in Arabia and answereth to Jerusalem. It is, 
because, because of its place in this whole story, it is accountable to Jerusalem. It answereth to Jerusalem, which now is and is in bondage with her children. Now he switches from the allegory and describes, he describes the spiritual connotation and says, but Jerusalem, which is above. Now he's not talking about Jerusalem on the earth anymore, the allegory. He's referring to the real Jerusalem or the new Jerusalem or the heavenly Jerusalem, which is above. And this Jerusalem is free, which is the mother of us all. For it is written, rejoice, thou barren that bearest not. Break forth and cry, thou that travailest not. For the desolate hath many more children than she which hath an husband. This is talking about Sarah with Abraham, how that Sarah was the one that had the promise but was not having any children. And he's saying she's dealing with the fact that, the, that those who, who are not in the promise seem to be getting all these blessings. And, and, and throughout, throughout God's dealings with his people, that was the way that it worked. Notice that Sarah had a barren womb. Notice that Rebecca had a barren womb. Notice that Rachel had a barren womb. Notice that Hannah had a barren womb. Notice that Elizabeth, the mother of John the Baptist, had a barren womb. Notice the impossibility of Mary's circumstances. She was a virgin and had never known a man. And in all of these cases, it required a miracle. The lineage that brought forth Messiah brought, necessitated a miracle to bring him forth. So he said, Rejoice thou barren that bearest not. Though she that is desolate hath many more children than she which hath an husband. Now, we brethren, as Isaac was, we are the children of promise. But as then he that was born after the flesh persecuted him that was born after the spirit, even so it is now. So what Paul is saying is that this is an allegory that we're reading about in the scriptures. It was a real life event, but it was an allegory that helps us understand the way of the spirit. He goes on to explain in verse 20 or 30, nevertheless, what saith the scripture? Here it is. Cast out the bondwoman and her son. For the son of the bondwoman shall not be heir with the son of the free woman. So then, brethren, we are not children of the bondwoman, but of the free what Paul is teaching here is that in the same way that Abraham had to make the difficult decision of removing from his life the mistakes that he made in the terms of Hagar and Ishmael being put out of the home of Abraham and Sarah, the same is true today. You cannot have sin and failure of faith in your life. You've got to remove from you the things that pertain to your flesh. You've got to remove the things that are sinful in your life. That's what Paul is saying when he says, cast out the bondwoman and her son. He is saying at some point, you're going to have to make up in your mind that I am not going to live after the flesh. I'm going to live after the spirit. At some point, you're going to have to make up in your mind. And that's really what repentance is. Repentance is you saying, okay, God, I'm not going to obey the flesh anymore. I'm going to obey the Holy Ghost. I'm not going to walk after the flesh anymore. I'm going to walk after the spirit. Notice what the scripture says in the Romans 8 and 1. There is therefore now no condemnation to them which are in Christ Jesus. But it doesn't stop there. It goes on to say, who walk not after the flesh, but after the spirit. So you are going to have to understand that your victory is never going to come through your own means. And this is what Israel is about to find out. Israel is about to find out that their victory is not going to come through their own means. It is going to come from the God of their fathers. And it's going to be an opportunity for the Lord to bring them unto himself. 
Hallelujah. Because the fear, the fury is going to rise up in his face. And the jealousy he has for his people is coming upon him. And he will arrive in his wrath upon the nations of the earth and the armies of the earth who have resisted him, who have rejected him, who have turned against him. But the apostle Paul tells us, that it, these things are an allegory. And that's exactly what this is, even in Jerusalem and Israel today. They, even though they are real life events, they are still an allegory of the things of the Spirit. The church is, the Bible says, the holy city. This is what John was asked when the angel of the Lord said, I will show you the Lamb's wife. And John looked and saw the Lamb's wife, and when he saw her, she was the holy city. She was the new Jerusalem. That's who she was. So when you look at old Jerusalem, you understand that old Jerusalem is an allegory for what the church is supposed to be. Now, this is why all of the nations want Jerusalem. Have you noticed that, that Jerusalem is the least likely city in Israel to be attacked? It's the least likely to be attacked because nobody wants to lay a finger on that holy city. They want to capture it, but they don't want to decimate it. They want to keep it intact because they all want to lay claim to it. Even right now, there's a mosque sitting where the Temple of Solomon once stood because both Islam and Judaism are trying to lay claim to that, that sacred site because they both want to lay claim to Jerusalem. Jerusalem means the teaching of peace. It is the city of peace. And every ideology of this world wants to lay claim to the idea that they have the answer for peace. That's why, that's why uh, communism will call it utopia. And Hinduism will call it nirvana. And, and every, every political ideology and every religious, religious ideology, they all have a word to describe peace. They want to lay claim to it and say, we know how to deliver peace to the people. I'm going to tell you that peace is not a place. Peace is a person. And the Lord Jesus, he is our peace. And we know where peace comes from, perfect peace, hallelujah, perfect peace. They will have perfect peace whose mind is stayed upon the Lord. Great peace have they that love thy law and nothing shall offend them. Great peace comes when you stop following after the flesh and you start following after the Spirit. That's where great peace comes from. That's where perfect peace comes from. And so these things are an allegory. What gives Jerusalem its protection is the statehood of Israel. So Israel steps in to the promise of Abraham and plants their feet. I mentioned it Sunday. My family was there. Our family was, was in Jerusalem at that time. The Timothy Urshan line, they were... They were missionaries to Jerusalem. They were Persian missionaries. So they were, they, they actually could be targeted by both sides of the fight. And they were, they were in Jerusalem and they were, had to, they described stories of having to lay on the ground while bullets flew through their house and flew through the walls of their homes and shattered the windows of their house because there was so much fighting going on as this this land became the state of Israel. The state of Israel is necessary for the protection of Jerusalem. If Israel is not a state, Jerusalem is not protected. And the same is true of the church. The church is not protected if Jesus isn't Lord. Jesus Christ is Lord. Jesus Christ is Lord. Jesus Christ is Lord. Jesus Christ is Lord. And he's one Lord. And there's none beside him. He alone is the Lord. There's none who is his equal. There is nobody who is superior to him. He is the Father manifest in human flesh. He's the one who took our shame to the cross. He's the one who died the death of a transgressor, even though he was perfect in all of his ways. He's the one who was buried in a borrowed tomb, who rose up from the grave.
and triumphant over death, hell, and the grave. He's the one who has all power in heaven and in earth. And he is the Lord of this church. He is the king of this kingdom. And that is what gives us our protection. Our protection doesn't come from the United States of America. Our protection does not come from the goodwill of people around us. Our protection doesn't even come from our ability to organize and put together a social construct and call it the church and meet together on weekly and frequent scheduling. That's not what gives us our protection. What gives us our protection is Jesus is Lord. And he'd better really be Lord, not just in word, but in reality. Hallelujah. And this is why you, you go to the United Nations today, there are nations represented there who absolutely will not acknowledge the statehood of Israel. They will, they, will, they will not do it. They will not acknowledge it as the state of Israel. They will call it, they'll call that area Palestine instead of calling it Israel. Why? Because they know if it's legitimately a state, Jerusalem is protected. And they want Jerusalem. That's what they want. They want Jerusalem. They want that holy city. And I'm going to tell you, the enemy wants the church. He wants the church. He wants us to stop being the church. He wants us to stop being who we are. And I'm going to tell you, ladies and gentlemen, we are the church. Do you know what that, that, that word is? The ecclesia. It means we are called out. Hallelujah. It, it, it means we are called out. You know what? I'll tell you how you know if you're in the church. If you've been called out of darkness and into his marvelous light. You hear what I'm telling you? If you're sitting on that seat coming to services, that does not mean you're in the church. You, you, don't, you don't get into the church by just coming to the church. Here's how you get into his church. You come out from among them and be ye separate, saith the Lord. That is repentance. You walk away. You walk away from the world. You walk away from sin. You walk away from ungodly behavior. You walk away from ungodly lifestyles. You walk away and you come out from among them and you are born into this kingdom. You don't sign a membership card to get into this kingdom. You are born into this kingdom. You are born of water, and you are born of spirit, baptized in Jesus' name and filled with the Holy Ghost. That's how you're born into the church. That's what calls you out of darkness. Hallelujah. And into this marvelous light. Praise God. You, you, can't, you can't keep dabbling in that ungodly lifestyle and think that you're a part of the church. No, you're, to be a part of the church, you have to be the ecclesia, the called out, the called out ones. Hallelujah. Glory to God. Some people think that, it's, that to be in the church means you're missing out on something. And I want you to understand, you aren't missing out. You've been called out. Hallelujah. What are you missing out on? What in the world are you missing out on? Why would you want to have anything to do with the stuff God pulled you out of? Do you know what the Bible said? He said, if you go back to it, it's like when a dog returns to its vomit. It's like when a pig returns to wallowing in the mire. Don't go back to what God brought you out of. And, and, and let me say this, don't go back to what God delivered your fathers from. It's one of the great tragedies of the Bible when Israel would look around at other nations and think they were missing out on something. So they would start worshiping some heathen deity, some idol that had no power to heal or to save or to deliver, and they would start worshiping something that God delivered their fathers from. My God have mercy. It's one of the great tragedies of the scripture. And it always brought the judgment of God upon God's people when they would do it. 
And I want you to know it'll bring the judgment of God upon God's people today. God has delivered us. He's delivered us from false doctrine. He's delivered us from heresy. He's delivered us from the lust of the flesh, from the lust of the eyes, from the pride of life. He's delivered us from the love of money. He's delivered us from envy and covetousness. He's delivered us from strife and vainglory. He's delivered us from the rudiments of this world. Let's don't go back. Let's go forward. Hallelujah. When the enemy comes in like a flood, we need to know that the Spirit of the Lord shall raise up a standard against the enemy. Israel, this isn't the time to retreat. Jerusalem, this isn't the time to retreat. This isn't the time to let the enemy terrorize you and your family. This isn't the time for the enemy to come in and you just sit back and let him do it. It's time to take up your battle stations. It's time to go to prayer. It's time to seek the face of God. It's time to cast out the bondwoman and her son. Some of you have been letting the spiritual Ishmael mock the spiritual Isaac too long. Hallelujah. And you just let it happen. No, you can't let it happen anymore. Look up. Look up. He said, when you see Jerusalem compassed with armies, are you kidding me? He said, when you see Jerusalem compassed with armies, look up. Your redemption draweth nigh. So look up. What does that mean? That, that, means, that means raise your spiritual level. Raise it. Look up. Set your affection on things above not on things on the earth. You've been setting your affection, your feelings, your heart feelings on things on the earth. Raise them up and set your affection on things above. Look up. The elevation language of the Scriptures. Lift up your heads, O ye gates, and be ye lifted up, ye everlasting doors, and the King of glory shall come in. Hallelujah. Hey, I'm going to tell you something. This is not the time to be scared. This is the time. You want me to tell you how not to be scared? You ready? Here's how, here's how you, you don't be scared. You look up. That's what you do. You look up. You get right with God. If you've got the bond woman hanging around, kick that habit out of your life. Kick that behavior out of your life. Get serious about God. Start coming to church. Start praying. Start being a blessing. It's time to have revival. It's not time to, it's not time to run away. It's time to have revival. It's time to worship God. It's time to welcome the King. I said it is time to welcome the King. We have been living for this moment all the days of our life. Oh my God. Yeah. Woo, hallelujah. I've been living for God because I plan to live with him for all of eternity. And I'm not losing out now. I'm not giving up now. I'm not turning around now. My God, have mercy. I'm not stopping now. Hallelujah, I'm looking up. The redemption of the Lord draweth nigh. Haya boho shahaya. Glory to God. I'm going to tell you something, ladies and gentlemen. And let, let me just say something to you, okay? We have to preach on the coming of the Lord. And, and, and especially when we begin to see things of this nature developing on the horizon. And it is in perfect fulfillment of the Word of God. And, and, and there needs to be a healthy fear in the sense that it wakes us up, cleans us up, shapes us up, and readies us for the coming of the Lord. But don't let fleshly fear get a hold of you. Okay? Don't let fleshly get a hold of you. Fleshly fear get a hold of you. You are going to be kept by the grace of God. You are going to be kept by the power of God. Ooh, hallelujah. The Lord is going to rise up in your defense. The God of Jacob, defend thee. <laughs> Be not afraid, for the Lord thy God is with thee. 
Hallelujah. He will bear you up upon eagle's wings. Ooh, I said he will bear you up upon eagle's wings. Hallelujah. You're about to see that the Lord, he is God. And all this stuff, I find a lot of times, I find that a lot of times people, uh, when, when we get a little shaky about the end time, we get, ugh, we get a little nervous about the last days, most of the time it's because we're, we're afraid of what, all the calamity that's about to happen. All the calamity that's about to happen. And we're scared of armies and tanks and nuclear warheads. And we're scared of, 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 all, of the, all of the explosive language that the scripture brings to bear. But, but let, me, let, me, let me say something to you, okay? That stuff compared to the power of God is nothing. Go ahead. Go ahead. Nothing. He mocks that stuff. Nuclear nothing. He mocks it. He's not afraid of it. He'll snuff it out with, 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 with one, one inhalation of his nostril. He has no fear of any of it. And he is your father. He's for you. And if God be for us, who can be against us? We are, listen, get right with God. That's all you got to do. Just get right with God. If you haven't been baptized, get baptized in Jesus' name. If you don't have the Holy Ghost, let God fill you with the gift of the Holy Ghost. Get to praying. Get to loving folks. You just get right with God, and you've got nothing to be afraid of. You just get right with God. You just get in his word, and you've got nothing to be afraid of. Nothing, nothing, nothing to be afraid of. Now, you say, I can't even, that doesn't make any sense to me. I know it doesn't. My great-grandfather, when he went back into Persia, he went back into Persia, and this is what he said. He said, I was ready to die as a martyr. He wasn't fatalistic. He wasn't crazy. He wasn't, he wasn't, he wasn't, he wasn't weird. He had a vision of God. And he realized, I'm not afraid of anything. There's nothing to be afraid of. I have got the Lord on my side. That's, that's what David said. He, David wasn't joking and he wasn't trying to, he wasn't trying to emotionally manipulate us when he said, the Lord is my light and my salvation. Whom shall I fear? How do you think David would just walk up to a, 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 a giant a giant who was like a ninja warrior from, a, from his childhood. And David just walks up to him and said, I'm not afraid of you, and I'm not afraid of your abilities, and I'm not afraid of your strength and all those weapons you've got, because I come in the name of the Lord of the hosts of Israel. And I'm going to tell you, a spirit of David is on Israel right now. There's a spirit of David on Israel, and they don't care what the enemy says anymore. And they're not afraid of the enemy anymore. And I'm going to tell you, when, when you get a vision of God, boom, it will zap the fear out of you. Don't, don't try to, you don't have to try to wonder what it's like. Don't try to force it. You just get close to God. Because you can't imagine it in your flesh. You can't even imagine it. Could you imagine getting on a plane and going over into the middle of the Middle East right now and setting up a pulpit in the middle of one of those protests, <laughs> opening to the New Testament. No, 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 you can't imagine, you can't imagine fearlessness until it gets on you. And it's going to get on you when you see God. That's what happened, and I'm coming to a close, but I feel the Holy Ghost. That's what happened when the Syrians surrounded Elisha's house. Some in here are like Gehazi. They looked out and saw the Syrian armies and said, oh, no, 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 oh, oh my goodness. Elisha, we're surrounded by the Syrians. And Elisha's rubbing his eyes and walking out, sipping on a cup of coffee, got a newspaper under one arm, and looks outside and looks at Gehazi, looks back outside and looks back at Gehazi, and he says, oh, you don't see it. You don't see it. That's what it is. He said, Lord, Open his eyes. And boom! 
the whole mountain was filled with chariots of fire. And Elisha said, Gehazi, see, here's what you got. You got to see what the natural eye can't see. They that be with us are more than they that be with them. And we are not afraid. We are not afraid. He is the Lord of hosts. He is the Lord of hosts. And he will come with ten thousands of his saints. He will come with ten thousands of his saints. And there will be a sword going out of his mouth. And there's going to be a name on his vesture that nobody knows but him. We've got a revelation of the name of Jesus. But the name of Jesus is the name under heaven given among men whereby we must be saved. There's another name nobody knows but him. Woo! Shandaba. My God, you need to, I almost said buckle up. Don't buckle up. Get the seat belt off and let's fly. Let's roll. Let's have revival. Let's pray. Let's see God do great things among his people. I want somebody who's ready to serve God with a reckless abandon. Somebody who's ready to reach the lost with a passion like never before. Come on, somebody stand with me right now. Lift up your hands. Lift up your voice. I feel some direction from the Holy Ghost. Here's what I want you to pray. Here's what I want you to pray. I want you to be afraid of what's going on. Here's what I want you to pray. I want you to pray it every day, and I want you to get in the book. Open up the book and open up your heart and pray these prayers. Say, Lord, let me see you in all of this. Let me see you in all of this. I want to see you. I want to see your name. I want to see your glory. I want to see your power. I want to see your armies. I want to see your right hand at work. I want to see the sword of the Lord. Comfort me, Lord, with your mighty hand. David wasn't trying, David wasn't being hyperbolic when he said, when I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, I will fear no evil. You are with me. Your rod and your staff, they comfort me. Listen to what he said. Thou, this is Israel. This is, he's talking and, 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 it's, and it's him and it's Israel and it's the church. He said, you prepare a table before me in the presence of mine enemies. I got bombs going off. I got, I got flares flashing. I've got enemies coming in like a flood. And I got a big napkin tucked into my shirt and a knife and a fork. And the Lord has prepared a table before me. I'm at peace, even in the midst of my enemies. That's where God wants to take you. Be vigilant. Be sober. Hallelujah. Be vigilant. Be sober. But don't be afraid. Come on, somebody lift up your hands under the Lord right now. Lift up your hands under the Lord right now. Lift up your voice under God. I'm opening these altars for somebody who wants to come and say, God, I need a touch tonight. Lord God, I need to make some things right. I need to know the time that it is high time to awake out of sleep. For now is our salvation nearer than when we believed. Hallelujah. I'm going to see a victory. I'm going to see a victory. Come on, that's it, that's it, that's it, that's it. Come on, that's it. Let's them get a hold of you tonight. Let's them get a hold of you tonight. In the name of Jesus, that's it. Let's them get a hold of you tonight. Hallelujah. I'm going to see a victory. I'm going to see a victory. The battle belongs to the Lord. 